Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No Till Market Garden Podcast, Episode Twelve, Season Two. Felix Hoffman. I feel like I've been admiring Felix's work over there at Salavi Weinheim for a really long time now. Because when I, uh, I would see these pictures of his gardens, and it looked to me like this sort of next level of market gardening. And what I mean is that it's like somebody with a history in serious sort of conventional horticulture got the bug to be a small scale market gardener. And that's kind of what happened with Felix. He's worked on larger organic farms. He did study horticulture. He also spent a season working with Charles Dowding and Steph at Homeacres. Oh, Homeacres. That's clever. Anyway, worked with Charles and Steph. Um, now Felix runs the show basically by himself at this at Salavi Weinheim, which is kind of a CSA farm in southern Germany. Uh, what a cool conversation, you all. And I'm super excited to bring it to you. But first... If you have not checked out our event in San Diego this upcoming February the 15th of 2020, do that now. I just sent out the discount codes to our Patreon members, so you can find those at patreon.com slash farmerjesse. This event will focus heavily on the amazing work of Jared Smith at Jared's Real Food. Jared's implementing a lot of really cool sort of permaculture principles, but on production scale and a profitable model. He's got some two acres of lasagna beds. He does hedgerows. He does a ton of interplanting. Um, and he's doing it all in a fairly dry climate down there in Southern California. Um, we just really love Jared's work. We think it has a lot of sort of universal applicability and we really want to highlight it. And we will also be joined that day by Stephen Cornett of Nature's Always Right to talk about some of the urban farm stuff he's doing in that same climate, so kind of a different scale. Um, also, Stephen does a lot of cool stuff with natural farming techniques and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then I'll be there too. Give a little presentation myself. We may even drag Josh Satin out there. So come, get nerdy with us, grab a beer. It'll be Valentine's Day weekend. So bring a date. Details at notillgrowers.com slash events. There will be links to, to all that in the show notes. Uh, one quick note before the interview, my audio has a little feedback in it because I am a pro, pro, capital P, podcaster. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Otherwise, enough for me, you all. Let's get to Germany with Felix Hofmann of Salavi Weinheim. <laughs> Felix Hofman, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Hey, Jesse. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's an honor. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely. I'm I'm excited to have you on. So I'd love to maybe just start with you telling us a little bit about what you have going on there at Salavi Weinheim. Tell us maybe a little bit about like what kind of acreage you're working with and sort of where you're located and those sorts of things. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, we're in um, southwest uh, Germany. So it's a small city called Weinheim. And so Lavi Weinheim basically means, um, the name means CSA uh, Weinheim. So it's um, a CSA program. And we are founded in 2018. And this season we are offering 55 uh, shares. Um, So yeah, 55 families basically come to the gardens once a week and pick up the vegetables that we produce. And that's um, my own output of the vegetables. There is no farmer's market or any other sales is just this, this CSA program and we also are a society I looked up this word I'm not quite sure if it's correct but yeah it's kind of like a club that people join so there's actually a lot more than these 55 members there's about 100 members and um, yeah the other members they just support us financially how does how does that work how does when you say that it's sort of a club and you have these patrons that are beyond your 55 what does that what does that look like are they just giving you like a yearly donation and then they're getting food for that or is it just a donation like what is that how does that work yeah it's a yearly it's a yearly donation and um all of our shares are for one season so basically these people they just support us for for one season but don't get any vegetables because we only own, uh, we are only offering 55 uh, shares but there's lots of people that that, that like the idea of, the, of this project and support us for a season with just some money. Oh, interesting. Okay, so they're so these are just sort of patrons of the farm, but they're not necessarily getting uh, any sort of compensation for that. It's more of just a, a donation to the farm to keep you all up and running. 
Yeah, kind of like you you do with the podcast. Yeah, just people that like the idea and they donate the amount that they think is worth it. Kind of, we are, we are not uh, suggesting an, an amount of money. They just pay whatever they like, really. Nice. That's super cool. So if you're doing so, those fifty five people that are there that are members, right? Who when is that like your max number? So you have fifty five spots, and then when somebody drops out of that. Do you fill that spot with one of the donors? Does that make sense? Like, is it is it kind of um, does that kind of get, bump you up on the list? Yeah, there's a kind of a waiting list. So people that are interested, they they put themselves on this list. And yeah, in the first season we did 50, uh, 40 shares, and now we're doing 55. And this is kind of I think I think um, 60 or 55 is kind of the limit of what I can do on my own, really. But um, we're thinking of maybe doing more next season and have another person come in, but yeah, this is kind of the limit that that we can do at the moment, um, working with hand tools and and this kind of scale. Yeah, yeah, that that's interesting. So it's pretty much just you then. How many? What's your? Is are there other people helping you on the farm, or is it is it really just kind of you you and and on your own? Yeah, it's mostly me. I'm I'm there full time and I'm responsible for. Um, for the organization and also for the people that help. Um, but there's lots of people helping on a voluntary basis from the CSA. So there's um, about four or five people that help one day a week, kind of a few hours. And um, then there's Melanie, um, and she helps for two mornings uh, a week, and she's paid for it too. So, yeah, but it's mostly me. That's their full time. Okay, that's great. So, tell us a little bit about how that got started. Is it is Salavi Weinheim? Is that your project, or is that somebody else's project that you're managing? Yeah, it's kind of um, it kind of happened like really quickly. Um, after my studies, I de- I decided to run a small vegetable farm, and I was looking for land and found these greenhouses that are basically right next to the the first garden I ran. And so, yeah, I asked I asked them if it's allowed if I'm allowed to use the the greenhouses to grow tomatoes. And at the same time, I saw kind of a newspaper article of a bigger CSA that wanted to do um, a drop off point here. Um, so I I thought, hang on, maybe we could just yeah have our own CSA instead of having a drop off point of another bigger CSA like that's actually quite far out. So that's kind of how, how the group and, and I met. And um, yeah, so we we decided to try a first test year with 40 shares and see see how it goes. And yeah, it, it went really well. And now we are actually having a waiting list. And yeah, the, the shares are really nice. So this is kind of how, how that went. And, and the place we are, we are growing at at the moment is the old city's nursery. Um, so it used to be a nursery for um, for like plants that the city needs, like flowers and shrubs, um, in the 60s to the 80s, and then it basically was an abandoned greenhouse for quite some time. And um, yeah, now there is a company uh, leasing the greenhouse, which is called Permatube, and they they make like permanent drip irrigation. So we're also very lucky that way that they allow us to to use the greenhouses and use the irrigation too. And you asked about the the size of the of the of the gardens. It's about 800 square meters of of undercover uh, growing. So most of our growing is undercover basically, and um, about the same amount um, of outdoor beds. So 112 meter beds, if that makes sense. Half an acre of of, of production. Right. So you have about. 800 indoors and then 800 outdoors kind of like that. Yep. And you're talking and I'm talking square meters. So that would be like, uh, yeah, that'd be like a 17,600 square feet. So a little bit shy of a half acre. Right. Yeah. Kind um, of like that, yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's great. That's a lot of space. Um, you can do a lot with that and you do a lot with that. When I look at the pictures of your farm, um, one thing that kind of stands out to me is it looks like a very, very compact, uh, conventional farm in an organic conventional farm, but a very like really well done. All the space is well utilized. Is that 
did you study sort of horticulture or anything like that? Like what got you into gardening? Yes, I did. Um, I did study horticulture like at X school from 2012 on. So that was um, a five year study. And I worked on kind of more conventional organic farms too. So this may, this may be why it looks like this. And um, also during these studies, I had the chance to to work at um, at homemakers, so at um, Charles's and Steph's place. Um, so that was kind of because of my studies, really. And um, yeah, I worked at one bigger farm for two seasons, which is called Gärtnerei Wiesnecker. And um, yeah, they are about seven acres of, of tractor-based uh, gardens. And lots of tomatoes, so that's kind of where I learned the, the pace of the work and yeah, the, the greenhouse work and all these kinds of things. And then yeah, I mix I mix these techniques with with Charles' technique uh, techniques really, and so that's kind of how how we work. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's great because that's exactly what I see is this, and it's it's kind of also something I see is the direction of of sort of small scale agriculture is. Um, more intensive using more of the sort of conventional methods, but in an organic system or in a no-till system. And, right. and, um, yeah, and I think you're really doing, it It looks great. Like it's, it looks so compact and, and oh, thank you. there's a picture of you holding these beans and I'll, I'll post this at no till growers.com, but thank you. Uh, standing outside of your, one of your small greenhouses and it's just loaded with green, you, you, the, the greenhouse is just filled with beans and it just looks so robust. Um, I, I'm curious, is that, I mean, you have to make a lot of use of that space to get 50 shares off less than half an acre. Right. Um, so that's kind of, that, that fits really well. Is there anything that you've kind of, I don't know, adapted from um, the, that conventional system that you don't see a lot on other farms? Um, let me think about it. Well, obviously the greenhouse growing is a big part of, of what we do. Um, the greenhouse space is really, yeah, it needs a lot of hand work and like continuous man maintaining of the crops and like the way we grow the tomatoes with the Dutch loading system and intensive pruning and uh, yeah, really dense planting. Yeah, this is kind of what, what I learned at, at the bigger farm and um, yeah, so that's a big part of what, what we do, but most of the outdoor gardens, I think... I was really inspired by by Charles's work, and um, I really follow his um, principles um, in the outdoor gardens. Really, yeah. Can you can you talk a little bit about that experience? I, you know, we're all fans of Charles Dowdings, and <laughs> and, and so and we had him on the po podcast last year, which was a lot of fun. Um, I I'm curious, like, what was that experience getting to work with somebody that has such so much experience uh, in in growing? Um, and how long were you there? Yeah, I think you said you were there a season. Yeah, it was basically one season. So from March to late August, and um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I I really was lucky to to work there, and I applied in in the winter, and I had with some of his books and followed his work for for a while, but. Yeah, to have the chance to work with someone like Charles is, it really helped me a lot. And to be honest, it changed my life, really. And um, yeah, he's a really, really um, helpful mentor or a good mentor to, to have. I still ask him a lot of questions. And we had two workshops here with him coming and Steph coming too. I mean, Steph, Steph is a great grower too. And um, I think seeing homemakers, seeing the garden in person and working there like day to day and doing the vac boxes and uh, like deliveries kind of made me uh, see what the garden could look like at this scale, really. Um, I mean, if you see videos on YouTube and follow the work on online, it gives you an idea, but like working in the garden is, 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 a, is another experience really so it really helped me a lot and yeah i think a lot of the success in this garden comes from comes from working with charles that's great so now i think I, i'd like to get into a little bit of your practices and have you talk about um your sort of garden management so when you started at that place with the greenhouses mm -hmm. uh were all the gardens already set up when you got there 
No, absolutely not. I set all of the gardens up, and also the greenhouses were full of of trash. At least one of them was, and lots of like metal bits and plastic bits. So like we cleaned out everything, and we prepared all the gardens outdoors. And yeah, actually, we we run four gardens this season. So there's four different small gardens kind of spread about, and the, but the main garden is in, in front of the greenhouses. Yeah, and we set all of these gardens up basically in two seasons. Yeah, that's great. Can you talk a little bit about the process of getting those gardens set up and ready to plant? Uh, what what were kind of your steps? You started with cleaning up, and then and then what? Well, it depends a, a little bit, but I think the best way to start a, a no dig garden is is without tilling. Well, uh, one garden we tilled up front, which was basically because there was a dig. A digger that um, pulled out some some concrete bits and he kind of left left the place a bit messy, so I tilled it to kind of level it out and then spread compost on top. But yeah, the best gardens I've done and I've started and I know many many no dig growers do it like that is basically just spreading the compost on on pasture on grass, and then have have them have the the beds tarped for for some months. And then plant into that, no broad fork, uh, no cardboard. Yeah, it's good. I think it's the best and the easiest way to start a no dig garden is with with compost and tarps on pasture. Is there is there a reason that you feel like avoiding the cardboard in particular? Um, no, not really. I've used cardboard a lot on smaller gardens, but I think, say, starting a, a 300 square meter garden with cardboard, uh, you need lots of cardboard and you need to remove the, the, the plastic bits of the cardboard. And uh, I think if you have time on your side, just don't use any cardboard and uh, use tarps. And you can reuse the tarps uh, for the garden size you like. So I, I like the tarps better, really. But yeah, I, I've used cardboard. It works really well too. And you're generally mowing that grass down pretty tight before you start out applying that compost and then applying that tarp, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mow and maybe remove some of the debris if it's like really wild <laughs> uh, mowings. But um, yeah, just uh, have it mown really short and then place compost on top, yeah? I, lo- I love how simple that is. Um and then in terms of bed management, are you just kind of following that that sort of no-dig style where you're applying compost maybe once a year and then planting? Um, is there any, have you added any nuances to that? Are you, you kind of mentioned that you weren't broad forking. Is there anything else that, uh, that is specific to your, to your system? Yes, well, um, we're doing only one big compost application a season kind of exactly like Charles is doing this is what I learned from him really and um, that means kind of like a five centimeter so six inch maybe six inch I don't know um, bad with inches but five centimeters cover per be- uh, of the, on the beds really and um, yeah then no broad forking I don't see I, I tried broad forking and for carrots, for example, because some people say that you will have nicer carrots when you're broad forking, but I don't really see see a difference. So, um, yeah, we stopped doing it. And, um, yeah, then we apply the compost kind of now as the, as the season is finishing outdoors. So as soon as some crops finish, we apply the compost to the beds, kind of rake it out. I use a little bed roller to, to have it really nice and, and firm on the beds. And then, yeah, we are ready to go for next season. And that's really one of the main, I think, advantages is that you're that you're ready in that they are ready in spring, like really early, uh, because your beds they they are ready. No plastic on top. Um, no need to amend anything. Yeah, you're you're ready to go whenever you like, really. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hope that makes sense. And then. Okay, so right now you're applying compost um, for next year to, so like you said, to have those beds ready to go. Are you pull, pulling a tarp over top of those, or are you putting uh, some sort of cover crop in? What's that look like? No, at the moment we don't. Um, we just apply the compost um, to the beds, break it out, and that's it. 
I'd like to work with with more cover crops, kind of like like you are experimenting with or fish fish farm. I I really love their work, but um, I mean they're on a much bigger scale than we are, and most of the beds in the garden now they're still cropping. So at the moment there's not many beds that are finishing, so it's it's too late to to have cover crops in the beds. We would need a bigger garden to work with with cover crops. And I don't really see the point of having a bigger garden, to be honest. So yeah, I kind of like the scale we are we are at now. So we're just working with with mulching as crops finish, and then there's basically two months or three months of of bare of bare beds or mulch beds, and then then we plant again. So that's great. So where in terms of compost access, do you have do you have a good resource for getting that amount of compost there? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have uh, lots of um, facilities here. There's g- lots of green waste compost, and the the compost we use is basically made from household waste and green waste. So it's a it's a richer compost, and I use um, manure compost too, which is um, cow manure compost. Um, so yeah, there's lots of cows here, lots of grain growing, uh, lots of garden waste. So our den- uh, our area is, is, is really um, densely populated. So there's lots of waste <laughs> um, and lots of compost available. Um, so that's not a problem, really. Uh, and we can buy it quite cheap and they deliver it right, right to the gardens. And yeah, one good thing to do is basically drop your compost right where you want to have it right next to the beds um, that really made made the work work uh, of spreading it uh, easier. So I, I order more often and have smaller loads kind of drop right next to the to the gardens really, and then spread it by wheelbarrows. Yeah, that's great. That's one thing that we found is um, putting. We have one spot that we like to put our compost, and that the dump trucks will actually go on because it's because um, it's actually got gravel. And uh, it's not that well located. It's well well located to like two plots, but the rest of the plots, it's not super well located. So we're we're kind of considering building out some roads because I feel like you lose a lot of labor having your shoveling yeah. too far, yeah, and having and and taking wheelbarrows and and moving it that way. And that's how you're doing it, right? Too, you're doing wheelbarrows. Yeah, for us, it's a really nice job to do with the with the members, with the CSA members. So we had a big like squash harvest last week, and then we kind of cleared out the beds with with fifteen or twenty people and spread compost with all of these people, and it was a really fast job. So yeah, that's kind of a nice job to do with with the CSA members and kids too. Uh, yeah. And then the other donors, are they involved in those sort of things too? The ones that are not necessarily part of that CSA, are they also coming out to the farm and do they have access to it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We do have kind of like an online forum where we um, discuss uh, everything. And yeah, they are part of that. And they are also uh, invited to any any activities or any like discussions. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. That's it's it's fun to see people invested in it in that way. Um, I think that's probably not an approach many farms in the states have thought about. Just saying, you know, asking to have people support the farm uh, just so they can do what they're doing. It's kind of like what you said with the podcast. Like we ask people to support it so we can keep doing it and do more of it. Right. Um, and then they get access to the stuff we're doing. I think that's a kind of uh, an interesting innovation. I wonder if there's not room for that in the United States more. Um, I'm sure some people are doing it, but I, it's definitely not something I've come across a lot. And also what, what we do are kind of, when I hear you talking about this, um, is the way how people pay. Um, they basically pay up front, like, like for the C, with CSAs in the, uh, in the States. But um, yeah, they decide the amount of money they want to pay for a season, so we don't give a fixed amount. We just give our like budget for the whole season so which is basically my salary and compost and seeds and everything we need for the season and then yeah people decide what kind of amount they want to donate to make this budget work <laughs> um, and if it doesn't work in the first round so basically everyone gets an email to 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 um, and they are asked to uh, to give the amount they want to pay 
and if it doesn't work out in the first round, then we are going to the second round. And yeah, but basically it worked out fine every time. And we even have uh, more money than we than we asked for. Um, so that's kind, kind of a neat system that allows also like maybe students or like younger people to join our CSA because it's it's quite expensive. But um, yeah, that way we, we are not, um, we make sure that also students can be part of it. Yeah, that, that is a cool system. I've, I've heard of a couple people doing similar things in the United States to that. And um, I love that sort of pay what you can model that, right. that some people will be willing and wanting to pay a little bit more and some will be unable to pay maybe what it's totally worth. Um, but then everybody gets it. And I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, and I, I love the idea of, of having the second round where if you just don't meet the budget, then you have to, then you have to try again. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to talk a little bit because it seems like tomato production is something that you all do really well. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the things you've learned in terms of intensive, uh, greenhouse tomato production that you think are, are extremely important? Yes. Well, I think, um, one of the things that are really important for good tomato production is um, pruning and pruning at the right time. So I think some people call it crop steering. So kind of um, a hard pruning at the right time will give you nice fruits um, and no pruning when, um, when it's cloudy will give you more growth. So um, you can kind of stress the plants with with pruning. So pr uh, with pruning, I mean um, taking off leaves. Um, so yeah, we take off quite a lot of leaves when it's warm, and we want the tomatoes to to ripen up. And um, also uh, the lowering, I think, is a really nice technique for intensive tomatoes. If you have a warm climate, then uh, you can really get a lot of tomatoes from a small space. So to give you an idea, we grow about 800 to 1,000 tomato plant, plants each season. And they're on 22 centimeter spacing. So yeah, it's really um, dense planting. But the lowering and, and taking off the leaves really allows us to get, to get good yields. And we have um, a lot of cherry tomatoes, uh, which grow really well here. Um, and a few open pollinated varieties too, and I save um, seeds of, of these tomatoes. So that's kind of also one thing I, I like. I mean, the the um, hybrid tomatoes like Sakura and these uh, the classic like Dutch varieties, they grow really well. But um, I like to support open pollinated varieties. So we are kind of leaning more and more towards towards these varieties. Yeah. That's okay. So, a few things there. Um, one, that's a lot of tomatoes. Is it, and you're only giving those to the CSA? Yeah, we are, and we are uh, making sauce and drying some. So, yeah, if if there's a lots of uh, tomatoes, basically people are happy. Um, yes, but I agree. It's 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 a lot of tomatoes, and also it's a lot of management and and work. But um, yeah, people have been really happy with the, with the tomatoes. And um, a lot of these plants are, are cherry tomatoes, so um, yeah, they are for for salads. And the other bigger tomatoes, they um, is not so many of them. Right, and then take us back through that, just to kind of get a little bit deeper into that pruning method and crop steering. You were talking about when it's cloudy, leaving the leaves on or taking more off. Like, can you can you elaborate a little bit on? when that happens and how to do that to maximize your, your production? I mean, taking leaves off uh, basically means um, you're, stressing, you're stressing the plants and, so, and you allow more light on the fruits. So that will give you more tomatoes ripening up if it's warm. So if there's a warm week coming up and I see the, some trusses are, are ripening up, we, we take off the leaves like right to the point where the tomatoes are still green or they're still flowering. And if it's really cloudy and there's not much happening, uh, I keep the, the houses open and ni nicely rented and don't take off any leaves and don't stress the plants too much. I know some people say you should uh, like prune the tomatoes when it's cloudy. 
um, because then they are not so stressed. But this is kind of how how it works. If if you stress the plants uh, a bit, you will get lots of like a push of tomatoes of red tomatoes. And we have like, I want the tomatoes to be red on the plants. I know some people they take them off when they're just blushing or not really red. But I find the taste is a lot better when you uh, when you have them like ripe on the vines and um so yeah that hope that makes sense and also we use a shade cloth uh in summer because we get really hot summers and um that can lead to like flowers falling off or um the the tomato crop kind of unhappy and um so yeah i use shade cloth for that and then are you doing any sort of additional fertilization like throughout the season no, I don't actually. Uh, we use um, manure compost and um, our um, garden compost. So this is the the richest compost we we can we can get. We use it for the tomatoes and for um, other greenhouse crops like cucumber and aubergine and peppers. And um, yeah, we have a we do a big application of of compost in spring before we plant in the tomatoes. So that's kind of like a five or ten centimeters layer of compost. And then yeah, that's that's it. No more feeding. And I find, um, I mean, now as we take plants out, they are kind of done. But throughout the season, they are really producing well just from the compost. And I mean, it's not just from the compost. Our compost is really, uh, yeah, it's really good for, um, to keep plants growing for a long time. It seems interesting that you're okay. So your spacing that you described is about uh, almost nine inches. Right. For for those who are listening, um, which is pretty close. And then, did you say? Apologies if I missed it. Did you say you're pruning them to a single liter, or are you doing a double liter? No, we're doing single liters. Um, you can do double liters like this too, but then you would um, give them more space, obviously. But yeah, we we do single liters. Is it? Did you? Is there a specific reason why you've preferred to go more plants and fewer liters? Um, I think it's easier for people that are helping when I'm explaining uh, that it's just one liter and we're pulling off the, the side shoes of, of that liter. Um, I, I've worked in, in greenhouses where there's, um, where there's two liters, which is, which is nice too. And you need less plants, but um, I like, I like the one liter system better actually. Yeah. Interesting. And then are, are you, it looks like you've got a pretty good um, propagation space in there too. Is are you, do you have a propagation space that's sort of separate from your greenhouse, or they they is it a propagation and greenhouse? Uh, sorry, yeah. propagation and like high tunnel growing space. Yeah, well, there's two greenhouses right next to each other, and one of them is our propagation area. So all of the greenhouses used to have kind of tables inside them for for pots to go on because it was a uh, like a nursery and. Um, so basically, our beds they they were underneath on a, underneath these tables. So in, in one of the greenhouses, there's still lots of like propagation tables left, and this is where we do our starts. And um, yeah, we uh, use a si simple heat mat to start things in spring and kind of germinate things on 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 the heat mat, and then move them to the the cold tables. And also tomatoes and aubergines and peppers, I leave them on the heat mat in, in March and April. And then they go on to the, the cold tables. And that's also one thing I, I think is really important for a good tomato crop is um, if you buy tomatoes in and they come from a heated greenhouse, they won't do as well as if they are started in a cold greenhouse. Like uh, They're more adapted to, to that kind of uh, growing condition. And I think uh, this is really important when you're starting your tomato crop in an unheated greenhouse early in the season, that the tomatoes you bring in, they're not from a heated greenhouse, obviously, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. And are you generally, are you doing grafted tomatoes or are these just, uh, just straight plants? Yeah, I've tried grafting, but it's uh, it didn't really work out well. But yeah, it's mostly um, straight plants. Some are hybrids, some are open pollinated that we save seed off. Um, yes, but 
I'd like to work with um, grafted plants more, um, especially if you want to maximize your, um, your production. I think it really pays off. I've seen really nice greenhouses with, with grafted plants. So, yeah, uh, it's something I'm interested in, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I I, uh, I mean, when you're doing the pruning, the pruning and the lowering and leaning, you're having people come and generally having people come and help you. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that seems like a pretty big job. You said that you were, you know, you would, you like the single leader cause that helps you to be able to explain that to somebody, but generally you're having people come the CSA members or whoever come help you do this part. Sometimes they do, but mostly it's actually me doing the tomato work. Um, yeah, but there are people helping me and yeah, it takes about, uh, like one morning, a week to do the tomato job so five or six hours if there's another person helping me and if it's only me it might even almost take a full day to do all the pruning harvesting lowering and you're kind of stringing them up again uh yeah so it's a lot of management but yeah it really pays off i think tomatoes is yeah one of the most uh, one of our most important crops yeah yeah that's great so in those conventional systems that you were working on, um, you said one was almost seven acres, right? Right. Yeah. Um, what are some things that you've, that you learned from there that you've been able to adapt? I mean, you, we've kind of touched on the tomatoes. Is there anything else that you've kind of brought from that large of a system down, scaled it down to what you're doing now? Yeah. Well, maybe one thing is, um, like the speed of planting, like when you're on a tractor planting, um you're basically just popping plants straight on the ground you're not really burying them or being really careful everything has to be really fast and i think many like home growers or uh, like smaller gardeners they they're really being like too careful uh, which is not necessary and really slows the process down and that's really maybe something i i learned and um, yeah, and generally speaking, like I said before, the, the pace of the work, um, when you see somebody harvesting that has done a lot of harvesting for years, it's kind of a, a nice pace of work. It's um, steady, but not too fast. And uh, kind of how to keep going the whole day without burning out is, is, is really something you learn on a bigger farm because we used to harvest leeks or or um also tomatoes for for a full day so basically just harvesting leeks for for a full day um so yeah you kind of learn how to how fast to go and how um how to keep going for for that long of a period but um yeah to be honest i enjoy working with lots of different vegetables <laughs> a lot more yeah Right, yeah, the diversity now is probably a lot more fun and a lot more interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a lot better, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting that sort of um, idea of of uh, economy of motion. I think is what my mentor used to used to call it. Just this idea of of when you're working in a really fast paced environment, um, you really have to learn how to do to be efficient and. Uh, and that's something that larger scale operations tend to emphasize because their, their labor costs are, are so high. Right. Um, but yeah, you, you, you learn to be really efficient and move quickly and be able to translate that to a smaller garden is something that somebody that doesn't have experience may not realize like how to be more efficient, how to be, how to work quicker, how to have a better pace, uh, but also a sustainable pace, like you mentioned, but um, yeah, and have fun kind of as you go. Yeah, yeah, and that's important too is to like enjoy enjoy that that pace. Um right. and and not make it break your back, but maybe even make it like challenge yourself a little bit and enjoy it. Um uh, yeah, okay. you got it. <laughs> Spot on really. Hey you all, just jumping in here real quick to get a word from today's show sponsor, BCS America. You already know about the legendary versatility of BCS two wheel tractors on the small farm. You know it's the most economical and time-saving choice for market farmers, building beds with the rotary plow, mixing amendments with the power harrow, and mowing cover crops with the flail mower. But a BCS two-wheel tractor can do much more beyond the small farm. BCS powers more than 40 high-quality PTO-driven attachments, each with the power and performance of an all-gear drive transmission. 
Blow snow with BCS's snow thrower, also known as the snow cannon. Chip and shred debris with the chipper shredder. Clean your property with the pressure washer. Irrigate your lawn or garden with the high pressure irrigation pump. Haul over 800 pounds, including yourself, with a rideable utility trailer. And now, spread compost evenly over 30 inch beds with the all new spreader attachment. Yep, BCS is pretty much the Swiss army knife of power equipment. Check out bcsamerica.com for the latest attachments, videos, promotions, and more. That's bcsamerica.com. Big thanks to BCS America. Back to Felix. So are you doing a lot of like um, wood chips in the pathways and that sort of thing? Like what's the management there look like? Um, Yes, we put wood chips on in the first season, kind of the same depth as we would put the compost on the beds. But I didn't put any more since then. And I think I'm not going to put more wood chips because I know you talked about it, but when you have a, a heavy rain and the soil is really dry, you you end up with all the wood chips on the beds. And um, I didn't really like that. So I'm basically now just going to put compost on the path too. And um, j- well, just a little bit like a sprinkle. And um, that way I, I can also hold the paths better. Um, but I see that the wood chips, they have a nice effect on, on, on fungi. So <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, that's that's the tough thing is that you want those wood chips in a path because they, they do have a really good effect, of, uh, you know, in terms of housing micro, you know, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Right. Um, but then at the same time, it's such a challenge to uh, keep them there. Yeah, they go into the bed, they wash out the pathways. You know, we were on a little bit of a slope, so we get, you know, these gully washing rains mm. um, that, yeah, we'll, we'll wash out anything that's in our pathways. So we've kind of allowed, like you were saying, with a little bit of compost, we've actually just, when we go through and rake a bed, maybe after we've transplanted something or before we plant something, when we've made a new bed, uh, I'm totally okay with some of that compost falling in the path because the other thing with wood chips is that they're very hard to cultivate around. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and yeah, that's one thing that we've found. It's just, it's, it's really hard to get a hoe around a pile of wood chips. So you end up having to hand pull the weeds, which takes more time. Um, so it's, yeah, it's this crazy balance of wanting that, that organic matter there, but at the same time needing it to be functional and not in the way or not wash out and waste your energy. All right. I'm, I'm watching this video on your Instagram of you transplanting these tomato plants. It looks like tomato plants. Um, no, it's aubergine, so your eggplants. Right. Um, and you're doing it, you basically just have a bunch of bare root plants and you're shoving them to what looks like soil blocks. Are you all doing a lot of soil blocks? Is that, what is your, what's your sort of propagation style? Um, I'd love to do a lot more, but um, now I'm doing them by hand, kind of with, with a small, what do you call it, uh, with a small gadget to, to, make the, to make the blocks, which takes a lot of time. So we use plastic trays for most of our starts, but for, um, for crops that want to stay in the greenhouse for longer, I use, I use blocks. Um, they just give a lot better quality plant. And um, I mean, most of the farms here, uh, like we are in a really big um, vegetable growing growing area, um, which is like 20 minutes from here. Most of the farms there, or all of the farms there use soil blocks. And um, it's because you will get a lot better quality plants. Um, So yeah, this is something I I would like to maybe change in the future um, to kind of convert everything to, to soil blocks. Yes. And yeah, and the brick pricking out that that, that you are asking, uh, we do a lot of pricking out. So kind of seeding the the aubergines in one small tray and give them heat for for maybe two weeks or three weeks, and that way you can start like three hundred aubergines in a very small tray, and then once it's warming up, I kind of prick them out into 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 soil blocks, and um, have them started that way. Yeah. Okay, and then are you doing that with tomatoes as well? Yeah, we, we, we do that with tomatoes as well. Sometimes I, I seed the, the blocks, kind of put one seed in each block, but I find it, I get a, a lot better results when I'm 
pricking out nice plants, uh, nice seedlings into into blocks, and also each block has a has a nice seedling in, in it. Then there's no kind of empty, not germinated blocks. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, that saves a ton of time. I know that that's why Elliot Coleman does those miniature blocks. Is that you can really adjust the temperature on that whole tray, and you can fit you know whatever a couple hundred in a very small space. Yeah. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to transplant from those mini blocks to the larger blocks. But I love to, to describe to the listener what we're talking about. You basically have plants, uh, bare root plants. They're really small. They're, they're kind of um, maybe like an inch tall. Uh, and then you're just transplanting. You're just pricking those out and plopping those into soil blocks. And then that's your, that's your process, which I've seen other growers do that, but it's, it's cool to see it in a more commercial setting. Um, so and one thing I wanted to comment on was uh, that you said a lot of the kind of larger scale growers, the organic growers, are using soil blocks. I'm assuming they're not using hand blockers, though. Do they have – are there machines that they're using that are uh, making them, you know, larger scale soil blocks? How does yeah. that – you know how that – okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I used to work with a machine like that um, when I worked at Gärtnerei Biesnecker. So be, uh, there's also one like big blocking machine that was invented in our area here in Dossenheim. And um, yeah, basically it's a machine where you put the the peat-based soil mix in a like big hopper at the front, and then it blocks uh, like um, it makes your blocks and it seeds them at the same time. So it's kind of like um, you know these the, the vacuum seeders? Uh, no, not vacuum. Like, not vacuum, but yeah, it kind of it drops one or kind of how many seeds you want in each block, kind of as you go. So it's really fast, and um, yeah, all the farms um, that make the blocks themselves they use these kinds of um, blocking machines. Um, I don't think there are many um, that do them by hand. Um, yeah, on a, on a larger scale. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So when you're putting, when you're adding that soil to the top of this machine, to the hopper, are is it moistening the soil for you, or are you having to add moisten the soil? Yeah, you have it's already wet. Okay. Yeah, you have to ha- have it at a, a really nice moisture, like not too wet. Uh, basically, the rule is when you squish the the soil mix, that there's kind of one drop or two drops of water coming out. But not like uh, lots of water, so that's going to to um, uh, like not work in the machine. You want it to be moist, but not too moist. Yeah, that that uh, that would be exactly how I would, we use soil blocks on our farm, and that would right. be about exactly how I would describe you the 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 moisture needed because that's the key. A lot of people say, um, you know, they don't really like soil blocks because they fall apart or. Um, uh, yeah, that they, they, they get too sloshy or something. But the key, that moisture is 100% the key. And you also have, have to have good, like you said, peat-based soil mix that will hold together and that um, will will form a good solid block. Right. Um, and then are you making your own uh, soil mix then? No, we For are. yourself? No, we are we are buying it. This it's called Klasman. So this is I think it's maybe the biggest soil soil mix maker in the world. I'm not quite sure, but it's a really big company in in northern Germany. And um, yeah, it's a peat based organic mix, and it's it's also called blocking mix. So it's basically for bigger farms to make to make soy blocks. But I put this into our plastic trays, which which works really well, and. Um, yeah, so we buy it, buy it in. I tried making um, the mix myself, which which works, but I think buying a good mix in is really worth worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I've I've made mixes. Uh, I made mixes for probably eight years, nine years before eight years, I guess, before <laughs> trying uh, like a professionally made mix, and I realized I'd never made one that good. No. And it was, and it was particular, and specifically, it was Vermont compost here in the states, um, and the Fort V potting mix, and it's it's incredible, and and um, and and yeah, it was it, it it completely changed my my view of what I'd been doing when making. I really felt good about making our own mixes using our own soil, but 
when I realized that the production and the quality of the plants was nowhere near the same thing, um, yeah, I've kind of abandoned that idea of making my own because it, it's not worth the labor to have worse plants. Yeah, I agree. And then did we talk about, are you certified organic? No, we are not. Um, some of the, the members asked, um, asked for a certification or thought it was really worth it. But um, I don't really like it. Um, I think it kind of puts growers into a box with things that are not allowed. And also the amount of compost that we're using, I think it would not be allowed in, in, in the certification. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe there's a way around it, but uh, we are using a lot more compost than, than is allowed, really. And, um, yeah, but nothing wrong with being certified. I think it, it's it's great. But uh, for our, like, CSA, there's not really a, a reason. I blog about, uh, about uh, everything we do, and people come to the gardens every week, and... Yeah, it's it's really a community project, so there's no really there's not really a reason to to be certified organic, yeah. Yeah, and I imagine that's another thing I was thinking with the with the compost. Um, my what I hear is that there a lot of the rules in um, Europe can be more strict on some of those things than they are here in the United States. Yeah, they are, um, and you can get in trouble actually, but. Um, yeah, I think, like you explained, it really depends on the context. On a small garden with like many crops, with many successions, I think it's a way different thing than than a bigger farm with tillage. Um, so uh, I don't really see the point in in these kinds of rules. So yeah, I'm just applying basically looking at the garden. If crops look poor, maybe we are going to apply more compost, but. Um, just uh, from soil analyses or, um, I don't know, uh, these kinds of uh, things, I don't think you can even tell well, what's happening in your soil. You need to look at the garden. <laughs> yeah, right. I, are you doing soil analysis of any sort? Like, is that of a concern to you? Or are you checking for phosphorus levels and all that sort of stuff? I've done one, yes. But I, I, to be honest, I, I'm not going to do it anymore. Um yeah, we, we have high phosphorus and Kali levels and high organic matter. Um, and I know that, but uh, I think um, it's, got, it's basically going to stay where it is. If you're not tilling the soil or if you're not moving a lot of soil around, all of that phosphorus and Kali is going to stay where it is. So it's good. It's going to be used by vegetables. And um, yeah, I can see from the way crops look that there is not really um crops look really good and um there's not um really any problems so i'm not really looking for any problems um to maybe say i need magnesium or i need uh, i don't know i need to lower my ph or right like uh, whatever if crops look good there's no reason to change anything really for me yeah yeah it's it's interesting and i i've heard and i don't know i you know i'm not a not an agronomist but i have heard that if Phosphorus will pretty much stay there unless it physically touches, you know, waterway. Yeah. It's not going to get in the waterway. Like, it doesn't leach like other nutrients. No, it doesn't. Hey, you all. One quick interruption from me. Josh Satin of Satin Hill Farm has joined the No-Till Growers team and has been hosting some live Q&As with podcast guests and other growers over at No-Till Growers YouTube channel. This work is partially funded by the Patreon page, where you can not only support the work we do at notillgrowers.com and with this podcast, but get discounts on events, on merch when we get it, and um, get the first stab at asking questions of these guests on this show. Josh's show will be up every Tuesday at 8 p.m. live. So check that out. It's at the No-Till Growers YouTube page. You can just go to YouTube, click on No-Till Growers, or you can follow the link in the description. Um, we've already had Charles Dowding on, 10 Mothers Farm. Uh, Josh and I will do our own Q&As. You can go watch those at YouTube and subscribe to our channel. Like I said, patrons get the first dibs on the questions. And at a certain level of patronage on our Patreon page, you get a shout-out on the show. So big shout-outs this week to William Henpen, Benson Morris, Isaac Buells, Jam Fortier, Jeffrey Hayes, Tiffany Jackson, Weaver Akers, Dr. Aaron Hawkins... C-Max Smalls, Dakota S. Jernigan, 
Fiona and Donnie, A Firefly Farm, Jared Kirst, Christine Albrecht, Pandora, Patricia Jones. Thank you all so much. Remember, you can also get a, you can get a shout out by being at a certain level or you can get a shout out by just bumping up your patronage. Even going from 2 to $5, I'll give you a shout out. We appreciate that. All right, back to the interview. I've seen that you're doing strawberries. Are you doing um, are you doing a lot of other fruits? Like I'm just thinking in your with your scale and your context, like things like watermelons or melons, um, or yeah, any of those long season crops. Are you doing a lot of long season crops? Um, no, we are doing lots of um, fast crops, um, really, like market gardening crops. But we do strawberries. And raspberries, we have two rows. In, even in the polytunnel, we have raspberries because they produce really well in the polytunnel. And I can plant um, like lettuces and, and other things next to the, the raspberries. But other than these, we don't really grow any fruits. No, I, I do some, I tried some trellised uh, melons in the greenhouse. These are Charentois uh, melons, so small melons. Um, they work really well, and you get about four or five fruits per plant. But then you end up with with uh, kind of lots of uh, ripe melons at once, and you need to kind of share them with the CSA, and they need to be kind of eaten now. They they, they can't really be stored. So uh, we kind of decided not to do them again and do more cucumbers instead, maybe. And yes, but we do some long season crops like bulb celery. Does, is that the name for it? Uh, the, the the root one, the celeriac? The root, root, yeah, celeriac. Ah, yeah, sorry. Celeriac, we do that. So that basically takes uh, the whole season to grow. It's planted in the spring and we are harvesting it now. Uh, um, then we do um, some leeks, like winter leeks, that almost take a whole season to grow. But other than that, I, I like to grow lots of crops that... Um, that um, are fast and once you harvest them the bed is empty so that's really good in a no dig system like carrots lettuce heads beets like once you harvest them like the bed is ready to be planted again there's no like like when you're harvesting broccoli there's a huge <laughs> plant left and you need to kind of uh, remove the, the the plants if you want to plant again and so these crops don't really work so well in a hand tended system um so yeah we kind of focus on on crops that once you're harvesting them uh yeah the bed is ready to be planted again if that makes sense yeah yeah no that that i mean that makes a lot of sense so are you what does your winter look like are you doing a lot of i i can't remember if you said that you were um going all year but is is the csa a year-round thing yes it's year-round um we we share the vegetables each week Year round and in winter, some like when it's really deep winter in from January on, maybe or late December, it's every second week. And um, yeah, so basically now we are clearing all the greenhouses of summer, or we have cleared all the all the summer crops and plant lots of greens and turnips and um, uh, spring onions in the greenhouse for winter and spring. And yes, our our winters can be uh, cold. Uh, but not like crazy cold. Uh, I think last season we had one frost of minus eight. I don't really know what what in Fahrenheit, but yeah, it's it's, it's not crazy cold. So if I put a second layer of, of fleas on on crops, it's absolutely fine. Um, it's more the light levels, more than anything, really, that that slow things down. Okay. Yeah. And for us, yeah, yeah, that's not crazy cold for the listener. That's like seventeen degrees. Right. Fahrenheit. I mean, it's cold, but it's not. You know, we get we get down to zero or below zero Fahrenheit here in Kentucky, so that's it's still quite a bit warmer. Yeah. And then, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, and we use um, uh, outdoor low tunnels too. I use them. So kind of the spinach we have outdoors now, I put um, low tunnels on top of them to kind of keep them going uh, through the winter and into spring. So yeah, a lot of the beds outdoors are still cropping in winter too. Yeah, that I mean, it, it's great that you're able to utilize that space too. That's. Do you have? I mean, is there heavy snowfall there? I always think of Germany as kind of like a cold, <laughs> snowy place. I mean, it's skiing and all that sort of stuff. 
Yeah. Um, but maybe not southern Germany. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We're in the south. And actually, we are in the warmest spot of, of Germany, <laughs> really. So uh, if you're in the north or close to the Alps, you will have lots of snow, obviously. But here we, we, we used to get snow, but in the last like five or six years, we just get very little snow. Um, so, yeah, it's really warming up. And also the summers uh, are really hot. Um, we usually get like about 70 or 80 millimeters of rain in, in, in June and July. And we didn't get any for the last two seasons. And it was a lot hotter than than it used to be, which is good for for greenhouse tomatoes. But crops outdoors they they suffer really. And um, yeah, so I, I think the the climate is. I'm not sure if it's climate change or whatever, but I, the climate is changing. We get less snow and hotter summers basically. Yeah, I mean we've noticed that too. We've also noticed. Um a lot of wind wind has been like a really big issue for us here is that is that also something that you have in terms of having those keeping those covers on over winter yeah i think yeah, well, that's the main thing keeping wind off um of the of the spinach or whatever you're protecting is it's only the wind really the cold it doesn't the, the spinach doesn't really mind um, the cold it's just the wind um, but yeah, you can have problems with, I don't know if you, if you meant that, but blowing the, <laughs> blowing the mini tunnels off. I've had that, had a storm and then had to re rebuild the tunnels, but, um, it only happened once. And, um, now I use lots more sandbags <laughs> to kind of keep them in place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, so in terms of storage, like, are you doing, uh, potatoes and, that sort of stuff and keeping that for the winter CSA? Um, no, we don't grow any potatoes so far, but we we grow like storage carrots, um, a bit of those, and uh, celeriac, like I said, and beets, like big big beets. We let them get really big and we store these for, for the winter. And then, yeah, but from when these are like uh, all shared out, we... We have um, mostly greens like kale, uh, spinach, salad mix, um, turnips. So yeah, fresh, fresh things in winter. And people are actually, um, I mean, it's not a full diet that you get in winter. That's for sure. But uh, people were, were happy. And it's only our second season in, in these gardens. So there's lots of room to improve on, on the winter growing. And um, yeah, I'm trying uh, like spring carrots the first time this year. So we are seeding the carrots now and see if, if they are ready in, in, in early spring. That is something I haven't tried before. So yeah. Oh, okay. So you're seeding them now and then hoping to pull them in like March. Yeah, kind of in the hungry gap when there's not much much happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah the um, we've had decent luck with seeding them now and pulling them from January through February. Right. I haven't quite gone into March because the, when the sunlight starts to jump like that, we run into bolting. Um, but we've done okay grab, you know, seeding them in October in our tunnels or undercover at least and getting them in January and February. Because I think that's a, that's kind of an, un, you, you know, they, they grow super slow, uh, but they get really sweet and, yeah. um, and yeah, that's a that's a really nice crop to have there in January and February going into March. Um, I've thought about growing them really heavily and then pulling them and having them in March uh, as storage yeah. in March and April, and then and then moving into to May and June with fresher stuff. Um, but just to be able to maximize that sweetness. Yeah, Did, I, I'm not sure. Do you know the Krautgard Gardens? Uh, is it is a garden like in Luxembourg? And, and I, I've seen them do it, so I think we can do it too. <laughs> it's kind of how, how I got the inspiration for it. And they are a really nice uh, no-day garden, so I think it might work here too to do it. Well, yeah, let's talk about that for a second, because that um, – can you tell us a little bit about this farm? Um, yes, they are in Luxembourg, um, like about one hour from Luxembourg City, or like 45 minutes and it's run by three guys um and now there's one woman who is an apprentice and um yeah they are doing the csa style farm with i think almost 200 members 
And um, it's about one acre of, of crops, uh, totally no dig. I, mean, I think they took some courses at Charles's place too. And um, uh, yeah, what to me is one of the nicest gardens there are really. Every time I come, I'm, I'm amazed. Um, lots of flowers, uh, really nice vegetables, um, and everything is really tightly managed. And um, also, the like they're not too stressed about their work. It's just working out really well. They have nice systems in place. So, yeah, it's a really uh, good place to, to look uh, at online. Um, they're on Instagram and, um, yeah, also their website is really nice. So they are really uh, a big inspiration to me. <laughs> hey, you all, just jumping in to say that the name of the farm he is talking about is Kraut Gart. So that's K-R-A-U-T-G-A-A-R-T. That's one word, Kraut Gart, and it's in Luxembourg. Um, you can find them on Instagram. They're super rad. Back to Felix. Yeah, that's it. I I love that. I think it'd be nice to to be pushing that, like you said, the hunger the hungry gap um, of that sort of February March era area. Be pushing more for fresh veg and trying to figure out more techniques for getting good, high quality fresh veg in that in that period for people who are growing in similar climates to ourselves, like. Uh, it sounds like your climate is probably even slightly warmer than us, but um, I think you're probably slightly more north in terms of latitude. But um, yeah, but yeah, our our uh, but being able to nail that March period would be huge because that is when I find the customers are the most hungry for fresh food. Yeah, and there's not much in the garden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's really tough because what happens is, like I said, we'll either crops don't make it like they're not going to grow that well up until March or as soon as March hits and we start getting more sunlight because you're getting the same sunlight in March that you're getting, I think in November. Yeah. So, um, or even late October. So you're, uh, yeah. So your sunlight starts to jump and crops take that as a cue to bolt a lot bolt, of times. Yeah. That, figuring out either crop varieties that work better in that situation or different techniques for getting them. I think that's a, that's a kind of frontier that we really need to be exploring as growers. Is there anything that you else you wanted to add, Felix, that you were kind of that anything that you're really excited about for, for your upcoming season to, I know you said you weren't really looking to expand. Is there anything that you're really looking to dial in even more? I mean, yes, kind of st starting out with a CSA like this was, um, is um, really nice for me because I do have a fixed income and, kind of can work in the garden but not be too stressed about sales but i'd like to maybe explore other marketing forms too um, like a farmer's market or you know the restaurants i'd be interested in that too and um, yes also i think there's a really nice movement at the moment of young people in germany that are um, interested in in growing vegetables or yeah market gardening and um so, yeah, I'm really happy to be part of, of that movement at the moment. And every, like, uh, kind of workshop I go to, there's so many young people that are interested in no dig and compost and market gardening. So, yeah, it's, it's really a nice movement at the moment. I think in the U.S., at least in some states, there is a, it's a lot of young growers that are doing it. And in Germany, there, there's a lot more coming now. So that's really nice to see. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. Um, and I think you all are doing amazing stuff. So Felix Hofman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. I, I love your work, Jesse. <laughs> All right. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure to follow Felix on Instagram and all the places. I will put all those links in the show notes. Also, subscribe to this podcast wherever you're getting it. Leave a review, especially if it's going to make me laugh. I like the funny ones. Check out the Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash Farmer Jesse. If you appreciate the work we do, which is a lot of work, something like 30 hours a week that I pour into just the podcast alone, um, go over there and consider just kicking in a few bucks that helps us going and growing and helps me to pay people to help me that's a lot of i, I use the word help a lot in there but it, it helps other than that you all thank you so much for listening we'll see you next week bye
No, I think I'm good. I'm, well, obviously, English is not my first language, so sometimes maybe there, there's a word missing, so uh, <laughs> don't uh, be hard on me, but 